nature though, so you have some poets who are writing uh, like an ode to a season, they're saying how awesome autumn is or spring or whatever, and then you have other poets who are writing very matter-of-factly, so again, uh, different ways to do that. So, inspirations. You can get a lot of inspirations for poetry from the things you see around you. Trees, houses, coats, sidewalks, plastic containers, snowflakes on the ground. Whatever objects can catch your interest, or even if you look around the room, maybe randomly pick one thing to zoom in on. Uh, for instance, you could look at the ear of the person sitting next to you, uh, unless they're going to be creeped out by that, and decide to write a poem about that. So, a good example of a poem that, <laughs> looking at each other's ears, um, a great example of a poem that was just really written about an object is, uh, I um, found online, see here, The Red Wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams. And this one's pretty famous, it's actually in a lot of literature textbooks. Uh, the Red Wheelbarrow. And you might think, well, the Red Wheelbarrow, that's a pretty matter of fact name, isn't it? Well, it fits because the poem is very matter of fact. Here's the poem. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow blazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. The red wheelbarrow uh, by William Carlos Williams is really just about a red wheelbarrow. You can look at it, but can any of you, why don't you give it a try? So what do you think the red wheelbarrow is about, looking at it? It's just very matter of fact and just simply about a red wheelbarrow. Yeah, exactly. Um, as far as yeah, as far as you can look at it, there's not much uh, like you can't really find. You can't slap a deeper meaning kind of analyzation on it. It's kind of hard because really, if you if this wasn't like um, it's it's almost about as long as a sentence. This entire poem. So it's not a long poem, and there's not much there's not many words to work with. It's a red wheelbarrow and rain and chickens. So. Uh, this is a great example of a poem that is inspired by something, obviously a red wheelbarrow, and has this image, so we imagine the red wheelbarrow, and we imagine it plays with water by the white chickens. Um, but, you know, William Carlos Williams didn't say, you know, I have to write about something a little deeper, I have to make this poem super long, I have to rhyme it out, make this super, you know, deep and poetic and everything, he just wrote it, and it's a poem. So, uh, what are some things, what are some objects in your everyday life that you think might make a good poem? Oh, uh, flowers. Flowers, okay, sure. Flowers are an awesome topic for poetry. Uh, I have so far stayed away from flowers just because I've read so many poems that have them in them. But that gives you a perfect opportunity to look at flowers in a new way. So, uh, you know, everybody has written like odes to flowers and they start with, uh, I think William Wordsworth has a really famous poem where he's like in a field of daffodils and stuff. Um, so flowers make an appearance a lot in poetry, but uh, the awesome thing about poetry is that um, unlike stories, uh, when somebody writes about vampires and everybody copies that, then it becomes a little bit, you know, nobody else wa nobody wants to read another vampire story. With poetry, though, somebody writes about a red wheelbarrow, you can write a poem about a red wheelbarrow, uh, uh, as long as it's not copied exactly. There's so many different ways to look at flowers or wheelbarrows differently. So yeah, great, write about flowers. What are some other topics that you might find in everyday life? We have flowers, what else? Uh, the carnival. The carnival, okay, great. So how would you... How would you write about the carnival? Would you be like describing it or would you be describing your feelings? How, what kind of angle would you take? Um, I would describe like um, what I would be look, looking at and like the different lights and sounds I could hear. Okay, so describing what you'd be looking at, the different lights and sounds you could hear. So uh, with the carnival, just like flowers, you could have so many ways of looking at it. You could do it exactly like creating this image for the reader to kind of be in your experience. You could tell a narrative poem, and a narrative poem is just basically telling a story. So you could tell a poem about uh, going to the carnival and how much fun you had. You could have a very image-based poem where it's kind of like you uh, um, you might describe the tapestry of what the tent is made out of or something like that, where you really zoom in something. So there's lots of ways to do that. And one more thing from your everyday life or something that you see that might make a good poem. Couch. Couch. Okay, great. Actually, 
that would be really good one because um, you know I'm pretty sure there have been homes about flowers. I'm pretty sure there have been homes about carnivals that are pretty famous. But I have never run across a really famous poem about a couch. Uh, so maybe you'll be the first. I'll see it in literature textbooks of 2015 or something. So I'm going to write down. And so about the couch. Um, what would be your ideas? Would you write like a very matter-of-fact poem about the couch, kind of like the red wheelbarrow, or do you think you'd want to expand on kind of like how it feels and what you do when you're sitting there and all of that? What is your angle? Um, I'm really not sure. Okay, that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, I I say I always say we write a poem about the end, but I feel super inspired by this right now. Why don't we together let's come up with a poem about a couch? It'll be a short poem, not like an epic, but let's write about a couch. So how do we write a poem about a couch? Um, get some ideas here, now. Uh, ideas. Okay. I'm sorry. The washroom stain on Love's cushion. <laughs> and I fell asleep even though it very good. The audio is really, the audio is super garbled. Um, so, okay, I heard cushions and not much else. Mustard. Mustard stain! <laughs> mustard stains on the cushions. Okay, Buster sleeps on the cushions. <laughs> mustard stain. Oh, mustard! <laughs> mustard stain! Sorry, okay. Uh, I don't know You're what's wrong with my hearing. Um, <laughs> okay, mustard stains on the cushions. Great. Uh, so we start with mustard stains on the cushions, creating this image. And you know what we do with mustard stains on the cushions? What does mustard stains on the cushions tell us about people who own the couch? That they're sloppy. Yeah, maybe a little sloppy, that they eat food on their couch, maybe they're eating food while they're watching TV or in the living room. So, you guys see how already with one image, mustard stains on the cushions, we learn so much about people? And that's kind of the amazing about poetry, is that you can capture so much in so little. Of course, we could also be totally wrong. And the people with the mustard stains on the cushions could actually be very neat and respectable people who had visitors come over and grab mustard out of their fridge and squirt it all over the couch. But, you know, the more likely thing is we have an assumption. Um, is there any way you could turn the lights on a tiny bit more? It's sort of weird just, like, seeing your shirts and nothing else. <laughs> because, like, that's the only thing I can see. I can pick out white, but it's really dark. Okay, thank you so much. So mustard stains on the cushions, what should our next line be? Uh, I ate a donut and fell asleep. <laughs> okay. I ate a donut and fell asleep. Uh, on the couch or just I ate a donut and fell asleep? I fell on the couch and then I fell on the floor. It doesn't take a break. It doesn't take a break. Is there, is there, is there a consensus on this? What our next line is? I, I, ate, I ate a donut and fell asleep on the couch. It doesn't fit the pool, John. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. Mustard stains on the cushions. I ate a donut and fell asleep on the couch. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so right here, we've again conjured up an image. You see somebody, and even though we haven't described the person who's eating a donut and falling asleep on, on a couch, we have our stereotypes, we have our automatic assumptions, and so I'm guessing that many of us are probably imagining the same kind of person here. Okay, so mustard stains on the cushions. I ate a donut and fell asleep on the couch. What else? My parents told me not to slouch on the couch. <laughs> okay, my parents told me not to slouch on the couch, and... Did you? What happened? What? Where is this going? Yeah, I slouched. I spilled my soda. <laughs> I slouched and spilled my soda. Okay, so this is becoming sort of a uh, a diary, the diary of a couch, apparently. Oh, well, actually, diary of a couch is a good title, but that would be more from the couch's point of view. So, diary of the messy people who are spilling stuff on the couch. Okay, I slouched and spilled my soda. One more stain. Uh, and what color is the soda? Blue. Bluish. Yes, blue. Bluish green. Bluish green. And uh, might be a good rhyme here, because green does rhyme.
and other things if you want to write. Otherwise, you can just put on. That's a mean stain. <laughs> okay. Stain <laughs> ruined. <laughs> Great. Um, and right here, not to be like too uh, too analyzing here, but green and stain is an amazing example of what you call a slant rhyme. That is to say, green and stain don't exactly rhyme like you know green and mean, uh, but they sound similar. They end in n. Uh, they have that sound. And so Emily Dickinson, if you read Emily Dickinson poems, a lot of her rhymes are not like um, you know mean and green. They are going to be things like green and stain that are slant rhymes. So you love those. Okay, and so uh, we want to end this narrative. What happens to the couch? Does it get thrown out? Does it get cleaned? Does it stand in the middle of the living room? Or what happens to this couch? My dog licked up all the stains from the couch. Oh, Okay, so. Enter the dog, and this is like kind of a dramatic way of saying um, the dog has come. Uh, the dog is on the scene now. Enter the dog. What's the dog's name? Stan. Stan Carl. <laughs> Stan Carl. Okay. What the heck? That's a weird dog name, but uh, Stan Carl. And what does the dog do? Lick the peace. He plays Okay, so I'm kind of experimenting here. Uh, with that moment in time where the bright red tongue darts out. Uh, and then, so how do we describe uh, how Stan Carl, so his bright red tongue darts out, and then what? He hops on the couch and mud gets mud on the couch. He hops on the couch, muddy and get feet. Paws. Um, oh, right, paws. Yeah, thanks. I keep on, you know, that would be a weird image dog with feet. Okay, muddy paws, leaving rainbow colors, brown straps. And then we need to wrap it up, so he, what does he do now? The rainbow color. Oh yeah, that would be a really awesome way and like sounding mildly poetic because I have to say right now, I mean no, I shouldn't say mildly poetic, you know this is a poem, this is a poem even though it is about a really weird topic and makes uh, very little sense, it actually makes very little sense, um, never mind, now we're going we're gonna to sum it up with this rainbow, doing brown tracks. Uh, and then maybe, so he realizes that it's kind of like this rainbow of colors, maybe because uh, somebody says, like, what happened to your couch, or his parents are mad, but he says, look at it, it's a rainbow or something. How, how does he, where does this rainbow live? Like, or do we just say it's a rainbow of colors? Mom and dad This rainbow of colors has to go. <laughs> okay, so let me out here. I hear you guys discussing among yourselves, but um, it's very hard for me to hear. So let's get one person to say, how do we work in this rainbow? Alright, well, this vivid rainbow couch. No, this vivid stained into a rainbow couch. Like, it's stained into a couch. Like, at first it was like a nice white, and then there were multiple stains, and then that stained into a rainbow couch. Oh, wait, just kidding. <laughs> okay, so first it was a white couch, then a stained then, one. Now it has been stained into a rainbow, like that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's read our wacky poem. Uh, really wacky. This is like actually the most avant garde poem I think I've ever written with a video conference in class. Uh, avant garde is like kind of um, cutting edge, I guess you would say. Um, that's, well, that's actually more complimentary with it. Uh, okay, so let's read this out. If you can pipe down the thing. Okay, mustard stains on the cushions. I ate a donut and fell asleep on the couch. <laughs> My parents told me not to talk on the couch, sorry. Um, I'm really breaking up the poem here. Uh, 
maybe that can be part of it. If you're like performing this poem on stage, you're like scheduled that. Okay. My parents told me not to slouch on the couch. I slouched and spilled my soda. One more stain, bluish green. That's a mean stain. <laughs> Enter the dog, Stan Carl. Bright red tongue darts out. He hops on the couch, muddy paws leaving brown tracks. At first, it was a white couch, then a stained one. Now, it has been stained into a rainbow. Okay, so, let's give ourselves a round of applause. So, you may look at that and, uh, I, well, I may look at that and call that wacky and avant-garde and really that does not look like a poem, you know, it's about a couch, but who's to say that a poem about a couch is not just as poetic as a very famous poem about a red wheelbarrow, right? Even though William Carlos Williams wasn't going into details about, you know, stains on the wheelbarrow. Still, uh, I think we have a pretty good poem here. So, you know, if people can write, if people can write a nursery rhyme about the wheels on the bus going round and round, I think that we have just as much license to write about a couch. That's uh, stains on a couch. Actually, that would be Captain Stains on the couch go on and on. Okay, back to the presentation. So, we can get inspirations from lots of things. We can get inspirations from couches, and we just wrote a very successful poem about the couch. Moving on. Uh, and if you, you don't think that things are dramatic enough, you can always exaggerate them. So, for instance, do any of you have maybe little stains on your couches? No, none at all. Like, you've never, you've never, ever, I don't know, um, like spilled some crumbs here and there, or maybe like wiped them up, but maybe got a little, I don't know. Yeah, no, no. yeah, yeah. 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 I, you, you probably, probably once or twice in your life, you might have eaten on your couch, unless some of you probably have really neat houses, and maybe you have like, I don't know, slip covers or something on your couches, but for those of us who just, you know, lounge around on our couches eating food sometimes, uh, you might have one or two discolorations here. But one or two discolorations, you might think, you know, that's not very dramatic. How am I going to write an interesting, funny poem about that? So with our poem here, does anyone, oops, never mind, it's not okay. Does anybody have a couch that is a rainbow of colors because of stains? No, not really, because, you know, by that time, your parents probably would have got thrown them away or something. So we can exaggerate. And um, that gives us a really dramatic, somewhat electrifying poem. So when people read poems about things that are insanely exaggerated, but speak a little bit to their own couches, if people can recollect maybe eating food on their couch before, or maybe having a small stain here or there, then they still can relate to that, but it's so exaggerated that it's kind of crazy. So we can exaggerate ideas from everyday life, like the couch stains. We can get inspirations for poetry from animals. We wrote about, we had a dog in our poem, Stan Carl. How many of you have a dog? Raise your hand if you have a dog. I, have a dog. I sadly can't raise my hand with you. Uh, lucky you, is all I can say, unless you're one of those really mean ones. Um, but uh, for those of you who have dogs, you know that dogs are probably really good inspirations for poems. And the strange thing is, is that even though there's so many of them around, I haven't seen that many poems written about dogs. So you could write a poem about your dog. You could write uh, an ode to my dog or something like that. And it would be uh, really interesting all about how great your dog is and make it, you know, really interesting to the rest of us. Or you could write a kind of detailed um, imagery poem if you kind of zoom into one aspect of your dog that you really like. For instance, their floppy ears and, um, you know, write a poem about that. So, inspiration to poetry from animals are very useful because they don't really run out. Did any of you, I'm pretty sure this is Dancing Fingers, not totally sure. Did any of you read Cow and Dancing Fingers? Yes. So yes. you did. Okay, well, uh, I, I guess I'll, I, I'll read it, but I'll be quick. Um, in Dancing Fingers, there's a whole section which is uh, about animals, feathers, horns, and claws. And if in Feathers, Horns, and Cloth, a lot of them are funny poems, so I'm not so much up. And so one of them is Cow. I have a most annoying cow who lazes in the sun. She torments every hen and sow and has a lot of fun. She gives no milk at all and moves away at night. Even when she's in her stall, she always picks a fight. Eventually, she ran away. Freedom had great allure. Away, away from her stall and hay. But she left a great deal of manure. 
So this is a poem about someone who's really fed up with their cow, who's always been nasty and moody, and uh, of course, leaves a nice going away present. So you can use animals as great inspirations for poetry. There's so many animals out there that you'll probably uh, never run out. Uh, so we can also tap into our personal experiences as sources of inspiration for poetry. And that's a really broad thing, personal experiences, because we've all had times where we've been humiliated or embarrassed. We've had times where we've been really sad and melancholy. We've had times where we've been just over the moon in happiness. So think of some of those times uh, that you had, that you felt really super strong emotions. And then think of why. So for instance, a time where you were super embarrassed. Does anyone want to share a time you were super embarrassed? Well, there was one time that uh, like, I saw this pair of, like, pair of clippers, and I, I didn't know that there were batteries in there, so I tried to test it out on my head, but then it just cut off my head like my ear. Lord. Wait, what? <laughs> it's like, Wait, you know, like, I accidentally cut off some like, hair right here, and then my mom was like, what happened? Like, I don't know. <laughs> that was just crazy. Okay. Sorry, what? <laughs> I Wait, cut off my like, There was batteries? Okay, you put something on your head. What, what did you put on your head? I didn't hear that. Like clippers. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, yeah. wow. That was when I was little. When you're little, yeah, that, 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 the all, the all absolving uh, when I was little, um, that totally takes care of it, we understand. Um, so yeah, putting, <laughs> putting a razor on your head, that is, uh, sounds kind of dangerous. Um, yeah, so my sister also had, a. Uh, Run ends with random shaving. I think she tried because she saw my dad shaving and she was like, oh, I should do that. Uh, and ended up, you know, cutting herself pretty badly. So, yeah, there are all those times where you make mistakes and uh, usually yeah. nothing too bad ends up happening. Um, other times you've been embarrassed. I'm trying to think of some myself. Uh, let me think. Um, well, while, while I'm thinking, anyone else have one immediately on hand? Look. I. <clears throat> I was bit by a wild peacock and everybody laughed at me. <laughs> you bit a wild peacock? <laughs> oh, wild. She was bit by a wild she peacock and everyone laughed at her. Oh, I see. You were bit by one. Okay, that sounds more painful. Yes, I was bit by a swan once. Uh, you know, the thing about swans is they're very beautiful. They're also very nasty. They will bite you when you try to feed them. So, uh, personal experiences, uh, and um, I have been swimming, and uh, one time when I was swimming, when I was like six, I was, ex mm, I'm younger, sorry, I'm like four or five, I was super scared of teenagers, just like no matter what, if there were teenagers in the pool, I would get away from them. Sometimes I was paddling along and I had like my little floaties on, I think, and uh, I see teenagers and I get so scared that I'm like trying to swim away or something. And in this, I don't remember that well, I uh, go underwater and um, I am having a hard time getting back up again. So essentially I nearly drowned because I was scared of teenagers in the pool. So uh, that, that was more scary than humiliating, but my mom, uh, you know, grabbed me up. So personal experiences that you dig up out of your memory that evokes strong emotions. So when I think back to that, I still feel, you know, my heart kind of clenches up because I think of how scared I was as a four-year-old. And so writing that, uh, writing about experiences that you've had in poetry that really evoke strong emotions, you, a lot of people go to poet, um, start writing a poem because they want to write, they want to create a poem that has meaning. But I think that if you try to start writing a poem, and you try to start assigning a meaning to it while you're writing it, then it ends up possibly becoming cliche because I doubt that, um, trying to think of a famous poem that doesn't want to mean, well, I doubt that people who write, who, who wrote some famous poems, that they started writing and thought, you know, I want this to be a super famous poem, I want this to be in textbooks and people will study this 30 years from now, and I'm going to assign it this really awesome meaning of blank, blank, blank. People might have wrote, uh, written poems in response to something. They were angry about something or how they felt about something, but usually uh, not because they were like, you know, I want to put this deep meaning on it. Um, so when you think about when you're writing poetry, you don't want to start by saying, I'm going to make this super deep and uh, have this awesome poet meaning to it. Start by writing about something that happened, something that makes you feel a certain way, that evokes strong emotions, and 
if it has some deep meaning, then it'll kind of come out while people are analyzing it. So uh, look at your personal experiences, think about how you felt, and uh, look at photographs of other times maybe. You could look at photographs from uh, a few decades ago, a few centuries ago, well, not a few centuries ago, but uh, a few decades ago. And another one, history is a great inspiration for poetry. So what, what have you guys learned in history recently? Uh, the Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War, great. So what uh, What are some of your feelings, thoughts, people you've learned about? Uh, essentially, any ideas for good poems about the Revolutionary War? Well, British were many people. Uh, I'm sorry? The British were extremely mean people. <laughs> okay, the British were extremely mean people. Uh, I can assure you that's not true today. But uh, during the Revolutionary War, well, yeah, the British were extremely mean people. Although you could say if you were British that the Americans were extremely mean people too. So it might be interesting to think about it from both aspects, write a poem about that. It could be a humorous poem. You know, you could start off with something like, the British were extremely mean people. They did blank, blank, and blank. But if you look at it from the British point of view, then the Americans were extremely mean people. On to that we did. So history, yeah, we, there's, if you think about battles, there's always two sides, or arguments, or uh, wars, um, whatever, there's always two sides to the story. And writing poems about that can be a good thing. So, what are some other things? Does anyone have an idea for a poem right now that you could share about the Revolutionary War? Um, about gr the gruesome battles. The gruesome battles. Okay, so. Uh, and oh. gruesome battles are always great, great poems out. So, uh, one, so let's say you wanted to tell the story of a battle. So you wanted to like uh, say who was fighting and how it ended and really describe the action. That would be something called a narrative poem. And a narrative poem is, uh, well, narrative means story. So a narrative poem is a story poem that tells a story. So some really famous uh, narrative poems. There's some really long ones like the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, which are uh, from Greek, uh, or they're about Greek mythology. Uh, and then there's also shorter ones. So narrative poems, you might write a narrative poem about, uh, yeah, a great battle or something. So history can provide that huge inspiration. So now that we've talked about where we get our ideas, and I hope that you're all overflowing different places to get ideas, water bottles, books, history, uh, then we're going to talk about some types of poetry. So when you just start writing poem, what we did earlier where we collaborated, we just started writing poem. We sat down, we wrote it together. We didn't say this is going to be a haiku, this is going to be a limerick, we're going to have this structure, we just decide on a rhyme here and there. But there are types of poetry where you can follow certain rules and create a sound or a look that is um, kind of structured and uh, similar to others. So, I'm going to talk about a couple, haikus, sonnets, free verse, limericks. So haikus are pretty famous. They're uh, very simple in structure, or they seem very simple in structure, but they're actually kind of complicated. 17 syllables in three unrhymed lines of five, seven, and five syllables. And these are very great uh, for nature, season. They can evoke this kind of calm, peaceful thing when you're writing about certain things. So Basho was a very famous haiku writer. Uh, in Japan, and his poems are widely read today. So haikus were uh, from Japan, as you can probably tell. So this is a haiku that I wrote to show an example. A lone chirp, the bird, left behind in its own nest, welcoming the dawn. Sonnets are 14 line rhyming poems of set structure, and William Shakespeare, the noted British poet and playwright, was famous for sonnets. They appeared a lot in his plays. And sonnets, there's different types of sonnets, but they're uh, all 14 lines and they have set rhyming structure. And then a free verse poem does not have a fixed poetic meter and is usually unrhymed with lines of different lengths. The American poet Walt Whitman wrote free verse and very famous. But actually a lot of the poetry that you read is free verse uh, because for instance our poem would be categorized as free verse because we didn't you know, say it's going to be this many syllables and have this many lines and all that. Limericks are five line poems that are usually humorous, and the rhyme scheme is A A B B A. So, the English poet Edward Lear is famous for limericks, and here's one of my own. I thought that you would like the pie, for at least I had the will to try. But yes, the burnt crust is too hard, and the filling is just lard. 
at least I didn't make you die. So, uh, Limerick, and that's the rhyme scheme, usually about something mildly funny. So, to our view, we can get inspirations from everyday life, current events, and pictures. We exaggerate to make our poems more exciting, and there are some different types of poems. So, uh, to go back online, um, and by the way, this is a great resource if you're looking for poems to kind of be inspired by, the Poetry Foundation, um, if you search poetry, it's the first thing that comes up, Poetry Foundation, they have a lot of poems, and they have uh, guides to many of the poems that tell you what they're about, and who wrote it, and more about the author. So if you're looking for a famous poem, or even one that's, um, you know, from, from a couple decades ago, that's not so nice, then you can probably find it here. They have a huge... Um, collection of po poetry. So, uh, I wanted to show you quickly a cool uh, poem, which is Halloween Party. And I did not write this, by the way, but uh, it is, it's very much to the style that I love to write. Um, so, Halloween Party by Ken Nesbitt. We're having a Halloween party at school. I'm dressed up like Dracula. Man, I look cool. I dyed my hair black and I cut off my bangs. I'm wearing a cape and some fake plastic fangs. I put on some makeup to paint my face white, like creatures that only come out in the night. My fingernails, too, are all pointed and red. I look like I'm recently back from the dead. My mom drops me off, and I run into school, and suddenly feel like the world's biggest fool. The other kids stare at me like I'm some kind of freak. The Halloween party is not till next week. So Halloween party, uh, and where do you think the author could have gotten this idea? Well, normally we're talking about embarrassing or humiliating incidents. Maybe this happened to this person, maybe happened to someone that they knew. So when you think of your embarrassing incidents, going to school dressed up for the Halloween party, you forgot when it was, or uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, whatever your embarrassing incidents are, having a razor on top of your head, uh, or nearly drowning because you were scared of teenagers. These are all great material for poetry. And you can write something really funny and humorous. You can write something super matter of fact, like what we did about the couch and what happened to the couch. You could write something, I didn't I didn't read this one out because it's super long, but um, To Autumn is a poem by uh, John Keats, a very famous romantic poet. Romantics is a school of poetry, not like the type of novel. And, uh, so very long, very structured, very uh, evoking images. Um, quickly, I'll just show you like the line of this. These are the beginning two lines. Seasons of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun. So nobody talks like that. Maybe they did somewhat back then a little more, but I, I doubt that anybody was like, hey, Autumn's really awesome, look at this mellow fruitfulness, my friend, and the maturing sun, you know, that would be a little weird in conversation. But the nice thing about poetry is that you can do so much, so many things with language that you might not do well just normally speaking. Okay, so uh, I don't think that we have time to write a second poem, unfortunately, but I encourage you all to think, where do I get my inspirations from and uh, for poetry? And write a poem, uh, either once you're back home or after the session, I'm not sure when you have time to do so. And think of what would I like to write about. Maybe it could be a time where you were really embarrassed or something happened to you, or a story or a battle. Whatever it is, write a poem. And uh, if, if you want to, you could go to my website and send it to me, and I would love to read it. Are there any questions that I can answer? Um, I have a question about dancing fingers. Mm -hmm. um, what inspired you to write a book that not only showcases your work, but encourages others to write as well? Well, probably a big part of my inspiration was, uh, it actually really started when I was five, curiously enough, because I thought, when I was five, I just really loved to read, and it didn't quite occur to me that there could be people who didn't like to read. So, when somebody, when uh, a friend of mine was like, oh, reading, I, don't, I really don't like to read that much. Then I just was kind of blown away. Uh, it's a little dramatic to say that my world shattered around me, but um, I was, yeah, I was pretty shocked. And so I decided, because I was very stubborn, I was a very stubborn five-year-old, and 
uh, when it's really started when I was six, I decided to go around to schools and talk about reading and writing to students and hopefully get people really interested in writing. So I would do a lot of collaborative writing like we did with writing his poem. He'd write stories, write poems. And uh, that was why I was inspired to write Dancing Humors, was because I wanted to show that poetry isn't just this really bland thing that, that dead people wrote. It's, it's alive, it continues today. And uh, it's, it's hopefully doing well, because if you enjoy poetry, and if you write and read poetry and pass that on, then you know it keeps on being part of our tradition. OK, so any other questions? When is your birthday? When is my birthday? It is October 15th, uh, 1997. Any October 15th here? None? OK. <laughs> Can you publish your poem in your next book? Can I publish your poem in my next book? Can't promise. Here's what, uh, the thing is, is that if I publish a poem, then it would be, um, if I publish a bunch of poems, it would become an anthology of poetry, uh, which would be great because then, you know, you have different people's poems. But if I publish one poem in a book that I'm not sure if it would become by a Doris Vita and so-and-so if it's one poem, uh, but definitely send me the poem. I would love to read it. And um, what I encourage you to do is think about sending it to, uh, like there are, um, I don't know if you've heard of magazines like Stone Soup or Cicada that publish uh, poetry and a lot of work by young people, but that's a great area for poetry. And then also, uh, if you want to publish it online and send it to me, um, I'd be happy to, if you're okay with that, sending it to other people as well. But I can't promise that I can publish it in my next book. Oh. Where are your video conferencing from? Where are my video conferencing from? Uh, right now my house, uh, my house is in Redmond, Washington State, uh, so I'm in this studio over here. Maybe it'll even show, that's my backyard, you can't quite see it, but uh, out that door. And uh, yeah, so this is my basement essentially. What art? What poetic art has inspired you to do your work, such as Edgar Allan Poe and Jack Frost? What um, what poetic artists inspired me to do my work? Well, I 